Are you ready? Okay, here we go. In what ways have cutting edge space technologies already contributed toward or may eventually contribute towards the goal of sustainability here on Earth? A whole bunch of different ways. Number one is weather. We used to just sort of wait for the weather to arrive, but now with our orbiting weather satellites, we can see the huge storms. We can watch the effects of the changing jet stream. Weather allows us to grow better crops and to prepare our people so that we don't have as much destruction. Um, navigation seems simple, but the global positioning system allows combines on Earth to exactly go down certain paths, to, to be almost a, a driverless agricultural machine, keeping track of crop health all around the world. You know, how are the, the bean crops doing in, in Asia versus in, in the Americas? What's happening around the world? That global understanding, which you can't get here on the surface, allows us to make better informed decisions on Earth, and with better informed decisions, hopefully, comes sustainability. Some might say that the carbon footprint of space exploration isn't justified, given many issues just as climate change. What are your thoughts on this? The people who think that the carbon footprint of space isn't justified haven't done their homework. How much carbon footprint is there? If you can't answer that question very clearly, then you're just speculating and making a guess. So what's the carbon footprint of one car? or uh, all the cars around Toronto, or the truck fleets, or the trains, or airplanes, or spaceships, versus what is the return that they give us. We couldn't measure most of the environmental changes in the world without having gotten to space to be able to see them. If we want to look at the health of the ozone layer, or look at the rate with which the, uh, the ice cap in Greenland and Antarctica is melting. It's melting at 400 billion tons a year. We wouldn't know that if we didn't have the sensors in orbit to be able to tell us. Measuring sea seawater levels uh, globally, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. And the number of launches, I mean, one launch a week versus billions of people driving to work every day, it's completely lost in the noise. So if you're going to make a stand on a technical issue, do your homework. Make sure you know the stand that you're, you're stepping onto and, and then look for ways to improve it and solve the problem. Yeah, that's, that's what I do for a living. Do you think we'll come far enough for the next hundred years to get off this planet before we all drown in the rapidly rising oceans? Well, the oceans are rising, but they're not going to drown us all. Uh, most people don't live within a few meters of sea level. Like here in Toronto, we're a couple hundred meters above sea level, so uh, there's not that much water. You know, it's not going to envelop all the high land masses. But a large percentage of the world does live close to sea level. And so we need to either raise where people are living or we need to stop the oceans rising. And hopefully we can do a little bit of both. Inevitably, the oceans are going to rise some, and they've already seen some of that effects in various places. We have to solve that problem multiple different ways. We need a different energy source. We need to do carbon capture out of the atmosphere, and we need to take care of the people that live near sea level. Getting off the Earth is not the solution. We need to fix the problems on the Earth while we're in the process of going to other places besides Earth. It's not an either or. It's all of this together. How has space exploration made you more environmentally conscious? I wish you could ride with me on board a spaceship. If I could float to the window with you, and we could just go around the world once. It takes 90 minutes, you know, the time to have a meal in a restaurant. That's how long it takes to go around the whole planet. And you see the incredibly, um, inextricably integrated nature of everything on this planet. How the weather and the sun and natural forces and people and the oceans are, are all completely intertwined. And you come away realizing, when you look at something like the Aral Sea, which has been a cataclysmic human example of bad decision making that has affected a whole nation worth of climate, you see that we can have a very negative effect on our planet at the, at the national scale. So you, you come away forever more concerned about being a better steward about the planet, but you also come away optimistic. It's a big, tough rock. And it's been here four and a half billion years. And we may be messing it up for ourselves. The world's not going anywhere. 
What we really need to become conscious of is how to do the things we're doing in a more sustainable way. It's not an unsolvable problem. We just have to take responsibility for our own actions. Is the fragility of planet Earth more apparent from outer space? Yes. When you stand outside anywhere in the world and look up, the atmosphere looks like it goes on forever. But in fact, half the atmosphere is in the first five kilometers. I mean, five kilometers on Earth, you can run that distance. So you really realize just how incredibly thin the atmosphere is. If the Earth were the size of an onion, it's thinner than one layer of skin. You also see how shallow the oceans are. They sort of look bottomless when you look at a globe, but it's just like, like after the rain, that skim of water on a puddle. You know, the Earth has a very tiny little biome in between the rock and the emptiness of space. And the fragility of that is worth recognizing, the preciousness of it, and the necessity for us to assume a responsible role in preserving it, and preserving it for our grandchildren.